All right, welcome to town meeting. Uh, it's 10.03, so we're a little bit late, but we'll make up for it. Um, my name's Jackson Evans. I just kicked my water bottle over. But, um, I've been town moderator for the last several years, and if Article 1 goes in my favor, I'll be town moderator uh, once more. So thank you very much for having me. Um, this is the 235th annual town meeting in Braintree, which is pretty wild. And it's, uh, it's the most electrified and microphoned up town meeting I think we've ever had. You'll notice we've got this amazing new sound system, uh, which, was, which was purchased through a grant. And it was the brainchild of uh, Braintree's own Larry Revit, who happens to be a, a retired audio technician. Um, and Larry came up with the idea for this system to help people who both have difficulty hearing, help people who are on Zoom hear better, uh, and folks who have trouble hearing um, hear everything that's happening in the meeting. So if you would like to take advantage of one of the assisted listening devices, they're basically a smartphone with a little adapter, you're welcome to get set up with those. And um, you can actually down, if you have hearing aids that support Bluetooth, you can download an app and it will pump the meeting right into your ears. So uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I, I just, I really want to thank Larry for his hard work on it. And I also want to especially thank Colin Evans who's behind me here, who uh, spent many, many hours helping to install the system, volunteering his time. Uh, so, and uh, Daniel Burson from the select board and Megan O'Toole also spent a tremendous amount of time here getting the system set up, which was operational, has only been operational for about the last 12 hours. So. <laughs> it's pretty great. Um, which reminds me of a joke. <laughs> uh, how many Vermonters does it take to screw in a light bulb? It, it takes three. One to do it, and two to talk about how much better the old one was. <laughs> but I think this is a great addition to our town meeting, and I think, um, can everybody hear me okay? That's, yeah. yeah. It, sounds really, it sounds really good, and I've got like a sinus thing, so I can't really hear anything. What's the name of the app? It's called Listen Everywhere. There's instructions. Yeah, there are instructions on the table. Right? There are some instruction sheets on the table if you want. To um, before we get started, I, I just wanted to say a few thank yous. Uh, as always, the Branch Select Board does yeoman's work throughout the year to, to keep our town going and to make good decisions about how we work. And I think um, they deserve a thank you for all their hard work. Um, Braintree wouldn't be Braintree without Jesse Broussard, our town clerk. She's very, she's humble too. So she, uh, and Janice Russell, our town administrator, does a lot of work throughout the year. On, on nuts and bolts work. Grace Persons has been on board for a little over a year, I think, and done tremendous, great work. Uh, and, and Dylan Pratt and the road crew, uh, you know, this has been a bizarre year. Yeah. Uh, I think, um, you know, they've really adapted, and that's really been the nature of the game. All the time. I just think we ought to underscore how horrible a year it has been for the roads you know, throughout this area. Not only the floods during the summer, but all winter long, they've been wrestling with either mud or frozen ruts right. uh, and and not only that but for a large part of the year they were only down to two people dylan and charlie and and i think they've just done a remarkable job for, for keeping us in, in the shape that we've had mm -hmm. yeah thank you First, Paul would say that he's at the end of a dirt road. <laughs> that ain't what he told me no <laughs> um and thanks to everybody who brought food. I mean, we all come for the lunch, I think, at, the, at some point. So thanks to everybody who brought food for the potluck, and don't forget to stick around for that afterwards. Um, I always like to ask, who's here for the, for who's the, for whom is this their very first town meeting or Braintree town meeting? Let's say Braintree town meeting. Will we have a newbie, two newbies, all right. Great. Who's, uh, who's been to more than five Braintree town meetings? How about more than 15? 
40? Wow. Okay, 50 town meetings. Who's been to 50? That's amazing. Thank you. Who is he? Tom Cooch. Oh, yeah. One of our auditors. Four right. Yeah. Um, uh, the other last acknowledgement I wanted to make is to, um, I'm going to actually read from the select board's report um, that Megan O'Toole submitted about two select board members who um, resigned this year. Uh, Keegan Hopp had served on the select board since 2017 and offered knowledgeable and informative perspective on all town issues. We appreciate the time he dedicated to Braintree and the community service and volunteerism he and his family continue to offer to the broader area within Braintree and beyond. So thank you, Keegan, for all your... Uh, and then, and then it, it would be, you know, not uh, remarking on Charlie McMeekin's years of service to our town. Uh, you know, it's really important to acknowledge that. Charlie joined the board in 2019, shortly after he retired from a long-serving board member, after filling a long-serving board member's shoes. As with other, role that, other roles that Charlie has filled in our community, there are many, and there are many of them, he dove headfirst into learning the workings of the town, and was a careful listener and thoughtful contributor to discussions and deliberations. Uh, Megan writes, she often relied on Charlie's guidance in handling the particularly tough elements of managing people and navigating contentious matters before the board. He was always willing to assist with whatever needed doing and was particularly instrumental in setting up the funding for Braintree residents that need help heating their homes with when other assistance runs out. He often offered me and other board members encouragement when we knew we needed it most and has become more than just a colleague but a friend. We could fill many pages with the ways in which Charlie has contributed to our community, but above all, we know him for his kindness and his friendship. We will miss him, his steady and his supportive presence on the board as he leaves even bigger shoes to fill than the ones he stepped into when he joined us. So, yeah, Each year we uh, include remembrance of residents who we lost over the last year, and I'm going to just um, list those folks who who we are missing this year. Uh, Eldora Howard, Tuck Doan, William Lawrence Milner, Robert Milo Fre Thresher, Roland Boucher, Nancy A. Swanson, Lucinda Pearl Brown. Uh, are there other names that folks that I missed here? This is, right. well, that's, uh, we'll remember them and they're in our thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> Last thing I want to, we're, we're going to go do the Pledge of Allegiance, and this, this is an important part of our town meeting, and I, I don't know if others read Paul Kend our own Paul Kendall's uh, recent commentary in an online news uh, website, VG Digger. I thought I would share some of what he wrote, because it's really uh, fitting, I think, as we move into our, our town meeting. Paul writes, on town meeting day, we begin by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to remind us of the values we share and to set the tone for our public discussion. Whether we were born in Vermont or are newcomers, our high school or college graduates, gun owners or haters, libertarians, progressives, Republicans or Democrats, the pledge reminds us of what we all hold most sacred, the unity of our nation and its promise of liberty and justice for all. Uh, his piece goes on to talk about the, the promise of equality that we're always striving for in this nation. And sometimes we drift a little closer, sometimes we get um, farther from it. But he talks about the history of the pledge, which is really interesting, and not something I really knew much about. Uh, our, the, the bones of our current Pledge of Allegiance actually dates to the 1890s, and it's endured to this day. So it's really um, a pretty amazing idea that we kind of share in, in moments like this. He ends his piece by saying, when we stand beside our neighbors and our children to recite the pledge, we commit ourselves to listen respectfully to the views of others and to gracefully accept the decisions of the whole assembly. That is what we do on town meeting day here in Vermont, and it is heartwarming to see it happen elsewhere all year long. So with that, I'll ask you to join me, uh, stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Now, uh, a few more housekeeping things, and then we'll get on to the, the orders of the day. Robert's rules are the basic rules of order that we're using today for this meeting, except where Vermont law takes precedent. You cannot change Vermont state law, and that's just the way it is. But you can change Robert's rules by a two-thirds vote if you desire. Articles are moved and seconded by the body, then restated by me before it's under consideration and debate on the article. Articles may only have one amendment at a time associated with them, and amendments to an article likewise may only have one amendment at a time associated with them. If you've spoken once on a particular article, you will not be recognized a second time during discussion on that article or amendment until all others have had a chance to speak. And I'll hold you to it, I promise. Um, you'll be allowed to speak no longer than 10 minutes and only for two times. Division of the House can be requested by one voter before or after a voice vote. So if, if, if there's a voice vote and you're not sure how it went, you can call for a division of the House, um, which means people will have to raise their hand or stand to show their vote, and we'll count them. Vermont law provides for a paper ballot on the request of seven voters, again, before or after a voice vote or after a division of the House. Um, debate may be cut off by a motion to call the question and then a two-thirds vote to do so. So if you think it's gone, the debate has gone on too long and it's time to vote, you can ask to call the question. And if two-thirds of the body agree with you, we'll vote and stop talking about it. Um, all motions, remarks, and discussions must be addressed to the moderator. So if you have a question, you can address it to me and we'll figure out who would best to answer it. I'll do my best to recognize you in the order that you've raised your hands. And new this year is um, we've got some microphones and so I know it's gonna be hard, but, but if you can wait until a microphone gets to you, it will help the sound system, it'll help people who are maybe watching on Zoom, um, and I will ask you to state your name before you speak, just so some of us know each other, but there's many new faces, so we'll try to get your name out before you start talking. Uh, remarks must be confined to the merit of the question. Under no circumstances will the speaker attack or question the motives of another member. The measure, not the member, is the subject of the debate, and at no time will a person be accused of giving false information or of being a liar or as having committed a lie. Instead, a person might say, I believe that there is strong evidence that the member is mistaken. <laughs> Vermont law prohibits consideration of an article, articles that have not been worn. That means that whatever's on our list today are the things we can talk about. Under other business, we can bring up other topics, but we can't take, um, we can't take action, uh, binding action on those items. Um, the, the goal, my goal as moderator is to help you carry out your meeting. This is your meeting. It's not the select board meeting. It's not the town clerk's meeting. It's not the moderator's meeting. It's your meeting, and I'm here to help you do your business. So if you have a question about where we're at in the process, or how Robert's Rules works, or what you should be doing now, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll get it sorted out. But that's the goal, is to carry out our business in an effective way, and I'm doing all I can to help you do that. Um, you can tell me if I'm ruling improperly. Like if I've made a decision to cut something off and not allow someone to speak, you can vote to, to uh, overrule what I've said, which I won't take offense to. It's at this time, I, I just want to ask if there are any folks who are not registered to vote in Braintree in our in the audience today. <coughs> okay. If any of the if if you you uh, as a not as not registered, you can't participate. But if you want to do same day voter registration, you have that opportunity. And in which case, you could vote uh, with your voice in town meeting. Does anyone want to vote same day registration right now? Right now, going once. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna next thing I'm gonna do is just read through the warning and then we'll move on to Article One and, and get to work. Feel free to follow along on your own copy. <clears throat> Town of Braintree warning, annual town meeting, Saturday, March second. 2024. The legal voters of the town of Braintree and the county of Orange are hereby notified and warned to meet in the Braintree Town Hall in person in said town on Saturday, March 2nd, 2024 at 10 a.m. to transact the following business from the floor. Article 1, to elect a moderator for the year ensuing. Article 2, to hear reports of the town officers for the past year. Article 3, shall the voters authorize the size of the cemetery commission to be reduced to three members, each serving a three-year staggered term. Article 4, to elect all town officers as required by law. A, a town clerk for a three-year term. B, 
B, a town treasurer for a three-year term. C, a select person for a three-year term. A, a select person for one year remaining of a two-year term. E, lister for a three-year term. F, auditor for a three-year term. Uh, G, a delinquent tax collector for a one-year term. H, a first constable for a one-year term. I, a cemetery commissioner for a three-year term. J, a trustee of public funds for a one-year term. <coughs> Article 5, shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $1,401,118, of which $1,087,228 shall be raised by taxes and $313,890 by non-tax revenues. Article 6, shall the town collect its real property taxes in two installments with the due dates being October 15th, 2024 and March 17th, 2025. Article 7, shall the voters authorize the disabled veterans' property tax exemption to increase from $10,000 to $40,000 of appraised value per eligible parcel in the municipal grand list pursuant to 32 BSA section 3802 subsection 11C. Article 8, beginning in 2025, shall the voters authorize the annual town meeting to be held on the first Tuesday in March pursuant to 17 BSA section 2640. Article 9, shall the voters adopt the following declaration of inclusion. The town of Braintree condemns racism and welcomes all persons, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, age, disability, or socioeconomic status, and wants everyone to feel safe and welcome in our community. As a town, we formally condemn all discrimination in all its forms, in all of its forms, commit to fair and equal treatment of everyone in our community, and will strive to ensure all of our actions, policies, and operating procedures reflect this commitment. The town of Braintree has been and will continue to be a place where individuals are encouraged to live freely and responsibly, to express their opinions, and listen to the opinions of others. Article 10, to transact, tra transact any other business of a, not of a binding nature, dated at Braintree County of Orange and the state of Vermont this 19th day of January 2024, signed by the Braintree Select Board. This brings us to <coughs> Article 1, in which I will uh, turn over the meeting to Braintree Vice Chair of the Select Board, Daniel Burson. Uh, Jackson gave me a sketch. Correct. I had to take a picture of that. Um, so, Article 1, to elect a moderator for the year ensuing. So, I'll ask for nominations. Jackson and Walt Palmer. Not me, but yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll second it. Okay, Steve seconds. So then we just vote. Uh, if there's no other nominations, Jesse can cast one ballot. Okay, so do I have any other nominations? Is there a microphone runner? Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, well. You need she's, one? Out, she's outside somewhere. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to enlist my children, but they're occupied. Anybody want to run microphones? Oh, right. Okay. So, uh, where? You yeah. So, Jesse, if you can cast one, I, don't, I guess that's how we do it. <coughs> cast one vote for Jackson Evans as moderator. I think that gives you the job, Jackson. Yes. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much. Uh, that moves us to Article 2, to the hear, the hear the reports of town officers for the past year. There's no voting on this. Um, it's really just an opportunity for folks to ask questions about anything that's, that are included in the reports um, that have been submitted by select board, auditors, listers, other town-related functions. It uh, doesn't include the budget at this point, I don't think. But maybe budget questions can be asked. Okay. Uh, are there any questions about any of the reports included in the town report? Well, hearing none, um, we'll thank all the folks who submitted those those dutiful reports. Thank you very much. Article three: Shall the voters authorize the size of the cemetery com commission to be reduced to three members, each serving a three-year staggered term? To bring this article to the floor, someone would need to make a motion to um, to bring this to the floor. So, and, uh, requires a second. Walt, I saw Walt Palmer's hand first. A motion has been made and seconded. The floor is now open for discussion on Article 3. Shall the voters authorize the size of the cemetery commission to be reduced to three members, each serving a three-year term? And the maker of the motion, which is Linda Doan, has the opportunity to speak first, if you wish. No okay, no comment. So the floor is open for discussion. 
No, come to the Can you explain this? Uh, I know the board, according to other article or information, works hard. Why reduce the number? Um, who, who, who would like to answer that? Because you can't find any people to stand up. That's it. So the, the so to Malcolm to expand on that, um, we currently have a five-member board, and we are having trouble filling the seats, and it requires quite a bit of work. But we feel like also historically it was a three-member board, and then got moved to five, and it operated well as a three-member board. We have three people currently, I believe, Chris. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. So. We're, we are, in essence, creating the board as it currently stands and not having those vacant seats that we continue to try to fill. Go ahead. It seems that, sorry, it seems that that's no reason to reduce the board. We need to find two more members. Uh, given the work that I think is there and that most of the people on the board do the work, I guess I don't understand the rationale still. For the cemetery commission? Well, We're the, talking cemetery, not yes. select board. Yeah. No, I'm okay. talking about this motion. The set, so the the impetus for this article, we were given this article by the by the chair of the cemetery commission because he thought this was a good idea. So I feel like if we take the recommendation of the people that run the commission, that might be I mean, that's why we did this, because they recommended it, the commission we, itself. We could ask the question, is there anybody here that want to uh, join the cemetery commission? You know, anybody at all, just raise your hand. What does the cemetery commission do? What do they do? Chris, you want to explain that? Or? Uh, there's quite a bit to be done sometimes during the year. Uh, answer questions, concern citizens. You got spring clean up. Uh, keep track of your mind. I can't hear you. Use a microphone. <laughs> can, you, can you use the mic? I can't hear you. Uh, anyway, there's quite a bit to be done. The spring clean up, uh, clean up all of leaves and limbs and whatever that come down, uh, get ahead of your uh, mowing. Jason's handy where to the mowing for us. Uh, once in a while, somebody passes along, so you need to do a burial, maybe a full burial. Uh, uh, cremations are quite common now. Um, stones tip over, tree limbs come down. Uh, <laughs> any number of things. So if you could find some other people, five might be a good idea. But if you can't, three's better than none. But does any, I have a question just, um, if we switch to three, could we go back to five yes. at some point? Yes. That's... <laughs> How many of the cemeteries are still open and selling lots? Uh, I believe Mountain View's the Mountain View right down the road here is the last uh, available uh, for lots. Lynn Beebe, and who takes care of that one specifically, or do the three of you all work on that uh, for, that, for uh, burials? That cemetery had been assigned to me through the years, but as a whole, if we had volunteer work, uh, everybody tried to show up and chip in and uh, get it done, taking care of whatever the volunteer work might be. And most of the time, if you know, stone repair, there was two, three, four of us that show up and fix a stone. So, yeah, Tim Caulfield. Um, what's the disadvantage to just leaving it at five and having two vacant seats? What's the disadvantage to just leaving the commission at five and having two empty seats rather than changing it, just waiting and seeing if we can fill them next year or some other year? Well, I, I don't know that there's any, you know, I mean, leave it open and see if you can find a couple people. There's how many people are here? 60, 70? There's 900 of us probably in town. 
Maybe you can find a couple. I don't know. One one problem I can see, Tim, and someone can correct me if procedurally this is wrong, is that you have difficulty with a quorum. If anyone, if any member is absent and there are only, Good point. then you have difficulty making decisions. So hamstring is the committee a bit in that manner. Other other comments? What is the quorum on three member board? Two. Two. One and one. Two. If there is a three-member board, it only requires two members to be present. With a five-member board, it requires three. So with only three active members, all would have to be present I at all the meetings. I thought it was the number that were present to make a decision. No. 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 Okay. That's better. <clears throat> Other comments? Hi. Good morning. Uh, Cal Pollen here. Uh, I'm not sure how this works, but I'd be willing to come on as an apprentice. Three <laughs> 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 board member, God forbid something happens to one member and they have a health issue and they can't make it. I could step in and fill, or I'd do a one year to see how it goes and what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Alternate? You can be an alternate? An alternate. Is that the correct term? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of keeping okay. five. As, yeah. as a suggestion, I'd be willing to. All right. <laughs> Jesse, Jesse, uh, Jesse. I think part of the other problem with keeping it at five is everybody has a year and they're staggered. So when people are looking at it and thinking, oh my gosh, I have to commit to five years, that's a little bit scary also. So if it goes to three members, it's every three years you're on for a three year period and it might not be so daunting to um, get more people involved. Uh, Ellen Fox, um, can we make it a three-member board and have an alternate? Is that a possibility? Because we have an alternate. <laughs> I mean, it's. I don't think it's in statute, but we can have somebody. I mean, Cal wants to serve as you know as an apprentice and help. I don't think anybody would turn him away. <laughs> Anybody, anybody else have anything they want to add to this? I'm not really sure where this leaves us in terms of the motion. Um, call the motion. <coughs> okay, Tim Caulfield. Tim Caulfield's. Uh, yeah, if there's no other discussion, we can we can vote on this as it as it's written right now. Uh, it sounds like we're ready for that. So, uh, the motion before you is uh, Article Three: Shall the voters authorize the size of the cemetery commission to be reduced to three members, each serving a three-year staggered term? <laughs> All those in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. So the motion carries. Thank you. And Cal, thanks for standing up and offering a warm body. <laughs> Article four, uh, to elect all of the town officers as required by law. Yeah, folks, folks who are standing, if you want to come in and fill in, we've got empty, we've got some front row seats. We've got some seats in the back. All right, so this takes us to Article 4, elect all the town officers as required by law. Um, there, uh, a second is not required for a nomination, so as we go through this, if you would like to nominate someone, you can just state their name. It doesn't require a second. A, a second is a nice endorsement, but it, it's not required. So uh, that brings us to Article 4A, a town clerk for a three-year term. Do I have nominations? Nominate Jessica Broussard. Jessica Broussard. Linda Dome nominates Jessica Broussard. I'll second that. Okay. Are there other nominations for a town clerk for a three-year term? Hearing none, I ask the town clerk to cast one ballot for herself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Article 4B, e, a town treasurer for a two-year term. Nominations? Um, three-year term. Three-year term. Thank you. A town treasurer for a three-year term. Nominations? Nominate Jesse Passard. Nominate Jesse Passard. Nice, okay. Other nominations? Hearing none, I'll ask the town clerk to cast one ballot for Jessica Broussard. <coughs> Article 4C, a select person for a three-year term. Nominations? Lou Helmuth. I second. 
need it. Other nominations for a select person for a three-year term? Stuart Kenny? I decline. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, other nominations for a select person for a three-year term? Hearing none, I uh, ask the town clerk to cast one ballot for Lou Helmuth. Thank you. Article 4D, a select person for one year remaining of a two-year term. Nominations? I nominate Lynn Beebe. Other nominations for a select person for a one, one year remaining of a two-year term? Chelsea Brown. Other nominations for a select person for one year remaining of a two year term? All right. Hearing none, and now that we have two candidates, was there another nomination over there? I heard rumblings. No? Stuart, uh, <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Stuart, the people want you. <laughs> they don't, they think they do. <laughs> All right. I thank you. Fair enough. We got a lot of other officers, so I think there's other yeah. room for you, Stuart. Um, okay, with two candidates, we uh, we have to vote by paper ballot, so this will get interesting and exciting. Um, could, could we hear a little bit from yes. each of the two yeah, candidates? Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, um, so yeah, if each of the candidates would like to offer a little intro. Um, I'm Lynn Beasy. It's kind of hard to read that. Um, I've lived in Braintree most of my life. Uh, I did leave for a short time, went south to Royalton, but I'm back. Um, I'm a bookkeeper for many years. I have managed graduate programs and higher education around the state. Um, it's a good time for me to serve. I'm happy to do it, and I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Chelsea Brown. I know a lot of you I recognize already. Um, I live on Bent Hill. I've been in Braintree for about eight years now. I grew up in Bethel, so not too far away. Um, I own the Weaver Dale Cafe in Randolph. Um, and I'm interested in learning a little bit more about local government and just better serving my community that I call home. And I quit those. And apparently we got the same dress code. Okay, so Jesse, you want to describe how, how this will work? So, give her the mic. I have one. Okay, me. Um, so, we'll have an entrance checklist and an exit checklist. I'll run the entrance, and Grace will run the exit checklist. So, we'll just form a line. You come over here, you'll check in, get your ballot and a pencil, go vote, and then you can put it in the box and check out with Grace. And we'll have her set up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what are the names of the people? So, yeah, uh, so Lynn BB, and spelling won't count, so just do your best. <laughs> Two, B's. Two B's. Okay. And Chelsea Brown. Okay, those are the two names. We should have brought a whiteboard, but um, so this is a good opportunity to get a little coffee cake, get some coffee in the bathroom, stretch your legs, and line up to vote. And we'll uh you know, after. I was like, what's that? <laughs> All right, 
everybody get enough coffee and coffee cake? Okay. Uh, with, thank you all for voting. With the votes cast, uh, Chelsea Brown has been elected with 47 votes to Lynn Beebe's 27. So thank you both for putting your hands up. And we'll To serve, I mean, this is we have room on the cemetery commission. <laughs> 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 but, but thank you both, and thanks everybody for participating. So, 74 votes that's uh, we got a good room here. That's excellent. Okay, moving on. Article 4. Um, Article 4E a lister for a three year term. Other nominations? I nominate Jackson Evans. Okay. Yeah, other nominations, please? <laughs> Hearing no other nominations, I'll ask the town clerk to cast one ballot for Jackson Evans. Stuart. Uh, Article 4F, to elect an auditor for a three-year term. Nominations? Lynn <laughs> Beebe. Does Lynn Beebe accept the nomination? I think not. I, no, I'm not going to hear. Who's the current auditor? Who is the current auditor? Uh, it's Lynn Brown. But he's resigning. Or Tom Cooch. <clears throat> no, it's it's Lynn and he's resigning. I, or he's done. Yeah. <laughs> his term, his term, his his term is off. <laughs> Lynn Brown is done. Are there other nominations for the? Uh, yes. Colin Evans. Colin Evans. Of sound system fame. Second. Uh, other uh, second. Other nominations for an auditor for a three-year term. All right. Hearing none, I'll ask the town clerk to cast one ballot for Colin Evans. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Article four. G. A delinquent tax collector for a one-year term. Nominations. <laughs> Just yeah. Other nominations for a delinquent tax collector for a one-year term? Hearing none, I'll ask the town clerk to cast one ballot for Jessica Broussard. Article uh, 4H, a first constable for a one-year term. Nominations. I nominate Steve Broussard. Other nominations for a constable for a one-year term? Hearing none, I'll ask the town clerk to cast one ballot for Stephen Broussard. Article 4I, a cemetery commissioner for a three year term. Nominations? Who is currently serving? Uh, one second. Is this Chris? No. It's currently held Chris, by oh, yeah, Chris. Chris. Chris, are you willing to serve again? No, thank you. Been 20 years. Thank no. you. By the way, thank you, Chris, no. for 20 years. Of <laughs> Cal Poolin. <laughs> I think he's accepted. Yeah. <laughs> Any other nominations for a cemetery commissioner for a three-year term? That apprenticeship went quick. <laughs> I'll ask Jessica Broussard to cast one ballot for Cal Poole. Article 4J, the trustee of public funds for a one-year term. Nominations? Jessica uh, Broussard. It's just Jessica Broussard. It's current. Linda Delnes. Other nominations for a trustee of public funds for a one-year term. Hearing none, I'll ask Jesse Broussard, to, or the town clerk, to cast one ballot for Jesse Broussard. Thank you. This takes us to Article 5, which reads, Shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $1,401,118, of which $1,087,228 shall be raised by taxes, and 313,000 by non-tax revenue. We'll need a motion to bring this before the body. So moved. Uh, second. 
A motion has been made and seconded. The floor is now open for discussion on Article 5. Shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $1,401,118, of which $1,087,228 shall be raised by taxes and $313,089 by non-tax revenue. That's the hardest part of this whole thing. Uh, the, uh, Regina, you have the privilege of speaking first, if you'd like, as the maker of the motion. Otherwise, we'll open the floor for discussion. I was hoping somebody on the board could just do an overview of the budget changes and Increase in the Hi there, uh, my name is Lou Helmuth. Uh, I am a new member of the board, not only elected to a three-year term today, but um, I filled the big shoes of Keegan Haupt uh, when he left the board in October. So I've been on the board for three months, um, trying to wrap my head around all of this. So I'll do my best to, to give you sort of my take on how I look at the budget. I was involved with the building of the budget. Um, <clears throat> and obviously what we try to do is um, remain very conservative and understanding that every increase yields a potential tax increase for each and every one of us. So we look at trying to provide the town with the services that the town needs, that the town has historically provided, and try to do our best to make that happen as cheaply as possible because we're all taxpayers too. Um, and so the result of that, as you can see, is a really detailed budget, you know, lots and lots of line items. But I look at it and say that, that we there is about a 5.5% increase in expenditures. And that totals about $78,000 of increase over last year. Um, that's occasioned by sort of external cost increases. Um, and, and when I look at the, you know, there are a bunch of like little, you know, $30 increase, $30 decrease, but the, the big ones that, that I see are um, fire department, $9,000 increase, health insurance, just because of the market out there, went up $20,000. Um, <clears throat> Telephone is a thousand. Insurance, property and liability insurance, and workers' comp insurance went up nine thousand um, dollars. Gravel went up twenty thousand dollars over last year's budget. Um, so all of that um, equals, you know, those, those bigger increases are one hundred and one thousand dollars of increases over which we had little control. Um, Thirty-five thousand dollars of that is road crew salary. Um, and that's because this year in this budget, we for the first time have a full cohort of, uh, of a road crew, which we've not had for a multitude of reasons over the past few years. <laughs> so that's, that's a $35,000 piece of that 101. So all of that is a 5.5% increase. The bulk of which, you know, we don't have a lot of direct control over, and we've done our best at every other line item to, you know, hold the line, definitely not, you know, doing anything extravagant, but trying to, you know, get the work of the town done. So that's my best shot. Thank you. Yeah. Other Good morning, Sherry Richardson. Um, are you able to tell me uh, how much town employees contribute uh, to the health insurance? And is that also determined um, based on hours worked, whether you're part time, full time, et cetera? I, I can kind of. I hate insurance and taxes. I, I pay somebody to do all that for me, but I'll try to explain it. Um, so, um, it does matter if you're part-time or full-time. Um, so there's four, seven of us that are full-time. Not everybody is on the health insurance. Um, and I can't tell you exactly who, because there's people that were going to be on and came off and, and, and everything. But um, as far as... I'm not 100% sure, and I, I may have to clarify this at, at a 
somewhere down the road, and maybe you know. I think it's, um, we contribute 10%, I think. I don't think it's 20. I think it's 10%. And um, we contribute, and then um, the deductible, the first 60% of the deductible, the town pays also. So we pay 40% of the deductible. So. And that ten percent uh, does that go up if you're if you have a two person or a family plan versus a single plan? Can you can you rephrase the question? I don't know that I understand the question. If you have more than one person on the plan, does that ten percent change? You meaning do we pay more than ten percent? Exactly. Uh, I mean, I'm asking the question because in, in most businesses, there the employee will pay a percentage of a single plan, or the employer may pick up all of the costs of a single plan. When you start adding more people to your plan and go to a two-person plan or a family plan, the employee is responsible for the additional amount. So that's what I'm asking. The employee no, does. The employee does pay more because I have a family plan and I pay the most of anybody um, towards the health insurance. But it's so still ten percent. The percentage doesn't change. Like, yeah, you can you can explain it better. What the hell? The percentage doesn't change the time. So pays ten percent. That's fine. The employee plays pays time to account. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. It, it stays the same. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, something in the back? Can you um, explain how the residential versus non residential tax rate is calculated and why there's not that much of a difference between a non-residential and residential. And can we increase the non-residential? <laughs> uh, yeah, Jesse, I think Jesse, between Jesse and I, we can get to something close to an explanation. Yeah, I mean, residential, you have to live here more than, um, yeah, 100, I think it's 180 consecutive days you have to live here to be a resident and claim residence here. You have to do that through the state of Vermont. You can't just come in and say I'm a resident. You can't just assume that we know you're a resident. You have to fill out paperwork and send it to the state. The state downloads that to the town and that's how you get the town residential rate. So anybody who does not live here gets the non-residential rate, or if you don't fill out that paperwork, you get the non-residential rate. Those rates change, and I... So the, um, the, the state of Vermont Department of Taxes sets the, each town's education side of the tax rate. And it's it, it's different for residents versus non-residents. Typically the non-residential rate's higher, um, the town doesn't, we have one tax rate for, for municipal taxes, which is regardless of whether you're a resident or non-resident, what, cha what changes is on the education side of it. So um, that's, that's where the difference comes in. And some towns, it's actually swapped where <clears throat> residents pay a higher rate than non-residents. Every town is different. The math is, will make your brain melt if you try to think about it too long. Uh, Luke Fisher, our math whiz on the Lister board, is, understands this stuff in and out. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's really complicated, um, and I, you know, it, it's different every year. So, what is it now? It's right here in the Yeah, it's in the front on the yellow inside cover. <clears throat> so, so you've got. Um, the non-residential education portion was 1.4409. The homestead was 1.4406. So three one thousandths of a penny difference currently in resident versus non-resident. 
I hope that answers your question, Nathan. I don't, it's, <laughs> is there a way to increase the non-residential? Uh, yes. right it comes from the it comes from the state. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Um, I don't really have a question. Um, I guess I just sort of have a statement. I don't know where other people stand in the community. I, I struggle with the term conservative budget when we talk about the town of Braintree. Um, not specific to this board. I think we've kind of had a history of maybe some excessive spending in the town. I'm not sure if people are aware if you look at the municipal tax rates in Orange County, but Braintree sits about second highest. Um, we have a higher municipal tax rate than the town of Randolph. We have a higher municipal tax rate than the town of Burfield. Um, and pretty much every other town in our county. Um, and that baffles me because we don't have a lot of municipal responsibility. We don't have sidewalks that we maintain. We don't have an excessive amount of um, municipal buildings. Um, I'm coming a little bit secondary in that I've witnessed Keegan sitting on the board for the last however many years he did and learned quite a bit from the sidelines. Um, my understanding and what seems to have been to explain to him over the years was Perhaps the original boosting of this high tax rate was to provide this general fund for our community, which basically provides sort of some additional cash base that sits there that can be used for backup. For example, this year, my understanding is we had $230,000 we were under budget that we didn't spend, which some people would say that's great, we're doing a great job. Then why are we increasing the budget again to our taxpayers? Because it sounds like we're already probably bringing in more money than perhaps we actually need to be. We have a general fund that's going to be $600,000. That leaves our select board with a whole lot of room to spend money on what they feel worthy. And perhaps we want to put that kind of trust in our select board. But recently, that came down to almost the purchase of a gravel pit that had a lot of contention from various people. And these meetings are hard because 40, 50, 70 of us sit here, not many in my age demographic, which I'm disappointed in, but I understand with kids and families. But we gotta be able to stay and live here. And if our tax rates just kind of keep sliding up with this idea of, you know, we gotta keep padding what we need, there's a struggle. I think there's room for improvement in our budget in where we do highway maintenance. This isn't personal to our highway crew at all. They don't set their budget necessarily. The town of Brookfield has 78 miles of dirt road they maintain. They do that at a budget of about $16,000 a mile. This can be figured by just looking at their town report from 2022 and our town report from 2022. We have 48 miles of dirt road in Braintree. And that, sorry, sorry 43 miles of dirt road in Braintree. Our cost effective comes out to about 22,000 miles, or $22,000 a mile. Sorry, excuse me, $28,000 a mile to maintain that. Why does it cost our town so much more money to maintain our roads than surrounding towns that have the exact same general setup? And are our roads in good shape? Yes. But are other towns also? Yes. Do we need a fourth road crew? That's been a question. I know that was a challenge for Keegan sitting on the board. I'm, I'm not sure we do. Um, again, Brookfield does 78 miles with four people. We got 48 miles, 43, excuse me, miles. I'm questioning, do we need to raise the budget this year? Can we sit tight and maybe start to take a look at the spending that we're doing so that my family can stay here and my kids can maybe raise their kids here? Because at a 0.09 budget or municipal rate that compares to a 0.04 in Brookfield, that's a real struggle to understand that. So I don't know, maybe there's a lot of explanation that we've missed over the years, but I don't think so. And I don't want to speak for my husband, but I will say he didn't leave the board because he wanted more time for his family. He left because he wasn't heard. And you get that gets old. I'm not sure the people on the current board have a really great financial sense of how to protect us. And I'm not trying to be personal. I just, I'm scared for our town and I'm worried. And I'm afraid that we just keep eyeing our way through these meetings here for lunch. I'm not here for lunch. I'm here so my family can stay. Other comments, questions? Uh, Luke Fisher, I'm a listener and I just wanna, oh, 
<laughs> You're never been accused of being quiet. I just want to make a small comment to address one of the things that you said. And um, to my, the best of my ability, I'll try to make it short and sweet. So when we compare tax rates between towns, we also have to think a little bit about when that town was appraised. So it's not just the tax rate, it's also where the town appraisal sits in relation to the current market. And I don't know specifically how that applies to what, what you said, it, and maybe it does or doesn't because I don't know where those towns are sitting in terms of their appraisal. When a town's appraisals get so far out of whack with the market, then the town has to reappraise, which is what we're faced with, and every town but two, I think, in Orange County. So um, I just wanted to, to, to make that point. Um, if I could just um, answer, respond to that, uh, Randolph is in the middle of a reappraisal currently, and Brookfield, I'm not sure if they finished in 2022 or 2023, but they just barely finished. So um, I don't know what their their tax rate is now, but I do know that Randolph's currently without the fire department or the police um, is five cents less than ours. So um, yes, we are more, but... Um, that's how much we are alive. Over here. Uh, with regard to the, the real the like, sorry. Uh, uh, with regard to the reappraisal, uh, where we were supposed to be every 10 years or so, now it's saying six years. We were just appraised in 2020. That brings us to 2026. But I've also heard, maybe I read it here somewhere, or I heard on the street that we were looking at starting reappraisals uh, possibly this year. That's for the entire state of Vermont. No. Oh, no, no we're, yeah, we're, I can, yeah. as on the, I'm on the board of listers too, and we, we do our, we are looking at a, a reappraisal in the next couple of years, a new one. Um, this, so the six year rule is a new state statute, mm -hmm. but your trig towns are required to reappraise when their statistical when the, the yearly statistical analysis shows that the assessed value is lower than the sale values or it's right. out of whack with sale values. Right, right. And so we finished our reappraisal right if, if you recall right as COVID was happening mm -hmm. and so we set all of our levels pre-COVID and then COVID happened and we've had three years of increased property sales and things selling way over assessed value. So we had all these fresh numbers in 2020, 2020 or 2021, and then those numbers are out of whack again. So Right, so are we looking at a 2026? We don't know. The state, in the summer, the state will send a reappraisal letter to all the towns that are required to reappraise, which will lay out the timeline for how that reappraisal will happen, when it should happen. There aren't enough people in the state to do all the reappraisals that are being required, so it's likely going to be several years before we actually get to a reappraisal. But we are headed there. Okay. Other other comments, questions? You got one up front. <coughs> My um, now from Patrick. My understanding is that if the value goes up, the tax rate should go down. Has that been occurring? Mm -hmm. Well, the tax rate's based on the grand list. And when, if the grand list increases, theoretically, and you're raising a similar amount of money each year, your tax rate would drop, it would go down. Has it gone down with the reappraisal that you did in the past? Uh, I don't remember where it went. It stayed pretty even. I mean, the goal of a reappraisal shouldn't be too drastic. It should, you know, typically a third of properties go up, a third go down, and a third stay the same. So you're you should be kind of equalized. But. Let me ask you, how much were we off from, so we have to have a reappraisal in 2006? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, you know, anecdotally, properties are selling for, I don't know, Lou, what's, what do you think, on um, average? Anywhere from 50 to 200, 200 plus percent. Over the appraised value. Yeah. So it's not, it's not untypical for a house that we have an appraisal on 
of 285,000 to sell in the mid fours. So the houses are going for way over the appraisal. But is it, then is that relationship hold when they reappraise? That's more value for the town for the tax go down based on that valuation. <laughs> You want it? It, it's, you, it's hard. you can't really predict it. It depends on what the budget is, how much we have to spend. The tax rate is a, you know, it's a combination of those two things, grand list and, and budget. But the, the question is that we're, the budget doesn't seem to go down. So, and so I'm wondering, just as the lady on the other side said, we're, we're spending money because we think we have it, because there's a tax system that encourages it really well the the changes that have been happening in the real estate market um have not affected the grand list because the town appraisals have not changed since the last reappraisal which was 2019 i guess so even though it's all over the place that is only going to affect it one there's a new reappraisal and then there's a new grand list so nobody's appraisals have changed in the town since the reappraisal unless there have been improvements to the property or subdivisions or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, in other words, the grand list has not changed drastically since the last reappraisal. Question over here. Is it appropriate to ask the select board to respond to Lindsay's comments? Uh, if there's, if, well. I have a couple things, but if you want to say something first, no, you're no, more than yeah. welcome to. There was a um, there was a question down front. So it's all, Lynn Beattie, um, when a house sells for the listers, you come and look at it after the sale and no? No, no, no. No, no. no there's no, that would be sales chasing, which they discourage in the listers world. Yeah. Well, another question. When I sold my house, I received a letter from the listers asking why it was sold for more. So, it probably didn't ask you specifically why it was so much more. Oh, oh, so uh, the, the state wants our grand list to be in uh, in whack. <laughs> <laughs> Not out of whack, but in, what, in, in favor of, of what things are selling at. If the sale prices get out of whack, with the grand list, that triggers a reappraisal. Um, and that's based on a numerical formula, which I'm happy to explain another time. <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought. The, the, the question is, um, when we send sales, the reason oh, we collect okay, so sales information. The state wants to know information about each sale. They want to know if it's a quote unquote good sale. A good sale is between a motivated buyer and a motivated seller, and it's an arm length sale. So I sell it to my kid, it doesn't count. Sell it to my neighbor, it doesn't count. Distressed sales don't count. Estate sales may or may not count. There's a list in our software, 20 items long, why we, by the state, will bump a sale. Um, so again, they're making judgments about a reappraisal based on what they consider to be valid sales. And all those things I just mentioned are what determine a valid sale. So when we send you a letter, usually me, I'm asking, so I'm asking, you know, did you sell it to a family member? Uh, was it a distressed sale? Did the seller take back a mortgage? All of those things complicate or influence whether it was what they, what's called an arm's length sale. Um, was there a huge amount of work done just before the sale? Was there two tractors and a dump truck included in the sale? So all of those things influence that. A follow up to that one. When I purchased another property in Braintree, the listers came and looked at it and measured it and so what was the purpose of that based on just my purchase? Uh, there must have been... Jackson. Yeah. 
Uh, we can, the, um, we are getting a little off topic here, but there, I'm not sure exactly. If you want to talk, if you want to call Luke, he's in the office Tuesday morning, he'd be happy to dig up the bill. I don't, and I don't recall specifically what the reasons were, but, but I do think we need to get back to the budget conversation. And I did want to, um, Steve's question to the select board about, uh, if they wanted to respond, I want to return to that. Is there any? You Jesse had a comment. So, so I did want to just um, discuss a couple of things. The two hundred thirty thousand dollars surplus in uh, fiscal year twenty three. Uh, part of that was due to the fact that um, income. Oh. 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 Shortage of excitement today. So, um, on the income side, uh, there was $143,700 extra brought in that was unanticipated. We um, we had a lot of uh, delinquent taxes that came in, a lot of interest that came in. Um, there was a lot of uh, we due to. Um, some money that we put into CDs and so on. We brought in uh, like eight or ten thousand dollars more than anticipated in interest and so on. And um, one thing that we had been doing was um, because we had had four road crew members for quite some time, we kept the salary in there for the four road crew members due to the fact that we were actively trying to hire more than the two road crew members. So um, that money was kept in there. So I believe that that was um, quite a bit less. Um, you can't just raise taxes so that you can build a surplus. Um, that $600,000 has taken quite a long time to get there. When I first came in, we were using tax anticipation notes. We were borrowing for everything um, and so on. And I, I feel like um, that we've just done a really good job in trying to keep uh, expenditures down and and so on. That six hundred thousand dollars didn't appear overnight. It's been um, adding for quite a number of years. Um, the the amount that is suggested uh, by GASB, the whatever governmental accounting, blah blah blah, um, is that you have fifteen percent of your budget in a general fund in case of emergencies, um, in case of flooding, in case of whatever, so that um, so that you have that. So the other thing that we've done, um, so I can do the math quickly. Um, so so well, that's not the answer. <laughs> right. Well, it was 21 million. So, uh, no. It's so 210,000 of that uh, um, should kind of just be earmarked to sit there in case of emergencies and so on, based on GASB recommended recommendations. Um, and then, as we go through. Um, the budgeting process and so on. Lost my track. Um, the sir oh yes, thank you. Um, so <clears throat> we do try to take some of that money and put it back in uh, to kind of keep the tax rate down. And the tax rates aren't set until this summer. Right now, uh, the select board has 25,000 of that 600,000 set aside to go back into the income to help keep the tax rate down and so on. And um, 
that can change as we get towards um, setting the tax rate this summer. Uh, I want to get other folks before anybody who hasn't spoken yet would like to would like to speak. Uh, I didn't know what the select board wanted to speak first. Oh, go ahead. I'll. I'll I, my name is Tim Caulfield. I was on the select board for five years, chair most of the time. And I, I would say that the select board works. The, these numbers are built line by line by line, as you said. And nobody's padding anything here. Uh, we're, we're doing it, at least when I was on the board, and I believe that's true now. Uh, there's just an, an effort to minimize the increase each year um, and to, to try to make sure it's minimal for the, for the citizens of the, of the town. I would encourage anybody who thinks otherwise to join the select board and get on the budget committee because that's that's really where the where the rubber hits the road and um, if if you don't like what the select board's doing uh, run for the select board and change it. Right. Select board, do you guys want to respond? I'll let it play out. I'll go okay. Okay, I'd just like to say that with, I did a little bit of research into why this tax rate is what it is for the town of Braintree. This is my perception on it. Um, pre um, 1990s, you know, the the population in Braintree was around 500 people. And somewhere in the 90s and for about 10 or 11 years up through, Braintree saw a 10% per year increase in population. So over that 10 or 11 year span, we had over 100% increase in population. But we never took the time to reset the tax rate. So now we have over twice as much tax money coming in that we don't need. And that's when I believe maybe late 90s, whenever the, the capital plan was, was built in the capital budget and the general fund that funds this was put together because I think the boards at the time were seeing more money than they needed. And I am for saving some money so that we're not spending money when we finance a truck or any of that. But I think that general fund is much more, so it has more cash flow than it needs. It's way overfunded. Um, like Lindsay said, the town of Brookfield, you know, I'll pick on them a little bit because when you look into it, their square miles are the same, they're the same size as Brookfield, okay? We have a simil similar population within less than 200 people. They offer the same thing that Branchery offers, which is dirt roads. That's it. There's no town pool, there's no town rec center, there's no recreation fields, there's nothing else. We offer dirt roads, they offer dirt roads. But when you take our budget, and this year's budget, if it gets voted in, and you divide it by the number of miles in our dirt roads, 43, we're looking at over $32,000 a mile. These two towns are apples to apples the same town. Theirs is $16,000 a mile. They don't have a huge general fund, but they do contribute and save some money over there. And I think if we looked at spending the same $16,000 a mile in Braintree that they spend per mile in Burfield, that would give us a budget of about $688,000. And we could add $100,000 to that and put that $100,000 a year right into our general fund and still be a lot less and well off than we are right now. Does that make sense to anybody? Yes. I, and he's been on the board. And so questions? <laughs> if anybody has a question, I'd be happy to try and answer one. Sandy Cooch, I've reported a lot of town meetings over the years. Um, I, I think that mile, you know, cost per mile kind of thing will vary a bit on how much you have in reserve funds. So, you know, um, I don't think Brookfield has many, if any. So if you're borrowing, 
uh, for a truck, or if you have to have a spike in costs because of gravel or whatever, that rate, I think, in Brookfield is going to go up and down and probably be more steady than the rate tree. Maybe the board can speak to that. Sorry, I'm the board. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not clear about the question that you're asking of the board whether the re, the the sur, whether the general fund is a part of the per road calculation. Is that what you're asking, Sandy? Who's the me? Yeah. yeah. Oh <laughs> no, I wasn't thinking about the general fund so much, uh, but. Yeah, I think she was asking about More the about effects reserve that funds, reserve right? funds play on that rate, on how the, the rate would change. That... Well, I, uh, I hope this is an answer. It would depend how much of the reserve fund is applied to this year's funding this year's budget. And this year, we recommended that we take $25,000 from the reserve fund and put it toward this next year's expenses from the general fund from the general fund right thank you for it. and and last year i believe the budget called for a fifty thousand dollar the, the town approved a fifty thousand dollar allocation from the general fund to the 24 budget so we're 25, thought we, we did $25,000 less this year. So I think that would then impact the, the ultimate tax rate because of how much we have to fund through taxes this year versus through other, this non-revenue source that you see in the article of $313,000. Does that help? Other folks? We just just so you folks know we just were purchased a new truck and the cost of these trucks that we need to plow and sand haul gravel haul away ditch material that we're cleaning ditches and, um went up almost a hundred thousand dollars since COVID. so that's just giving you an idea of just how much stuff has gone up and i really feel that we have shaved uh, we started with a higher uh, budget than what is presented in front of you. And we went back to the drawing board, the ones on the committee to set the budget up and shaved some off and came up with some ideas to uh, keep the tax rate down. Um, and when Keegan was on here, even when Keegan was on, it'd go up a little every year, but not as significant as this year. And of course, it hasn't, you know, the, the equipment and stuff like that hadn't gone up like this has since COVID. It's really crazy the amount of money they want for it. Even if we went back to a single axle, it would be like $80,000 more than a one back before COVID because we just priced one in Roxbury. So, so I'll try to take a minute. I don't know that I can answer every question because it's been a while and I made some notes, but I don't know that I got it all. Uh, I want to echo Jesse's point that the surplus is not built from us raising your taxes to bring more money in to stuff into savings. Generally, all that, or the majority of that money, especially that $230,000 that was mentioned, came from sources outside of the line item budget. Is that correct? You correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's their line items, but we got more money from correct. the state of Vermont than we anticipated, than they told us they were going to give us. Um, and we also brought in $110,000. Um, extra in delinquent taxes and another 11000 in delinquent tax interest um, over what was anticipated. So those were not the, those were not items where we over budgeted specifically in order to put money back later, I guess is what I'm trying to convey there. 
Um, I want to also echo what Jesse said that uh, it's not a bad idea to have a lot of this or have some money back for emergencies. I know of at least one town in central Vermont who was hit with the flood this year who had plans to build a massive facility to benefit their town and now that's gone because they spent all that money to deal with floods. Uh, I also know one town in the Upper Valley who's proposing a 20% tax rate to their citizens <coughs> because costs have gone up so much across the board. So everyone is being affected by this. We did our best to play in the margins to keep things as low as possible. Um, also, sometimes what this general fund allows us to do is to buy things outright rather than financing some things. We also have vehicle funds and equipment funds and so on and so forth, but it can help us save financing charges to the town. We're going to enter a situation soon with our vehicle fund, fund despite all of our planning, that it's going to start to run dry. So we've been in the past buying our equipment outright because we'd saved up enough money. But like Lauren said, this latest truck cost us $100,000 more than the previous. So the budgeting and planning changes when you have a 40% increase in cost of a piece of equipment over the course of three years. So having some money that we can help offset financing also helps us. Um, and like Lou said, I will echo that also, we do our best to not necessarily level fund the budget every year, but to incrementalize tax increases. We, if you get to a position where you do not have a surplus and you lower taxes too drastically every year, you will enter sort of a yo-yo phase where taxes will drop dramatically, then you run out of money to offset taxes and they'll rise dramatically and then they'll fall and they'll rise and so it becomes a difficult thing to budget for, both for people personally paying taxes and for us as a town. So there are a lot of considerations that go into this. We do sit down and look at every line in the budget to try to get it as trim as possible. And this is where we end up this year. Folks who haven't had a chance to speak yet. <clears throat> we got one back here, someone who has not spoken. I want to give them a chance for Ellen Fox, but I also wonder with um, the increases in taxes. I know in other towns that we split, we split the payments not just in two but into four, and sometimes that's easier. I don't know if that's anything that the board has. Oh. I'll, I'll just say, um, in the town of Braintree, when it went from one payment to two payments, the town voted to not um, collect interest until after the second payment. So in the town of Braintree, you can make your tax payment anytime you want. You can pay it ahead. You can pay it on March 15th. You can wait until March 15th to pay your taxes. We prefer that you don't, but you can. You can, uh, there's some people, I swear, they pay it before they even have their tax bill. I don't, we send the tax bill, they're in the next day, they pay the whole thing. So we don't have to adjust it at all um, because that is a thing. If you want to come in and pay monthly, you can do that too. Like call a question. I have my hand up here. Yeah, so I will give you your last, last word, then we'll call the question. Thank you. Um, I, just a couple of things. The, the CLA does not impact the budget. It impacts how much individuals pay toward the budget, right? So it's just, it's a, it's a shift of the money. Uh, this person is paying this much in taxes, this person's paying that much, and the CLA, the reappraisal happens, that person's paying more, maybe that person's paying a little less. I have never, ever, in all the years that I've lived in Vermont, I've never actually seen a reappraisal be done when the market goes down. I've never seen it. I'm not sure when that ever happened, but I'd be interested in, in that. 
questions. Um, but the bottom line is, first of all, I just want to say, I don't think anybody here suggested uh, dramatically lowering taxes. I think what I heard Keegan say was, um, or maybe it was Lindsay, suggesting level funding because there was the surplus money, because there is this money in the general fund, and because nobody knows what's going to happen with taxes over the next year or so, with the reappraisal, et cetera. This is, it's not just you know, the cost of the truck that went up as a result of COVID. Everybody's costs went up across the board. I mean, you cannot walk into Shaw's supermarket without dropping 200 bucks on two bags of, of groceries. Everybody um, is feeling those pains um, from COVID. And furthermore, I, I think it is, uh, it would be really disingenuous to think that you can continue to just um, uh, see the raises in, in taxes um, and, and the increase in the budgets not that some of this stuff isn't really necessary, but this is a time right now where everybody personally, professionally, and, and in the municipalities have to tighten their... Second. All those in favor of calling the question uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So I'd like to request a paper ballot. Okay. Uh, paper ballot, let's see. We need... Seven other people. Who who else would like a paper ballot for this? But this item. One. You need seven. Seven people. If you want a paper ballot. <coughs> Just don't Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Clarify what we're voting on. Who wants to say your name? Oh yeah. So sorry. The question before the board, uh, the body is. Shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $1,401,118, of which $1,087,228 shall be raised by taxes and $313,890 by non-tax revenue? So, Sherry, back to you. You had called for a paper ballot. Are there other, who else would like a paper ballot? Raise your hand now, please. This is verbal vote. I think a paper ballot can be requested any time on the approval of seven other other voters. But I have not seen seven other hands. So Jackson, just another question. If people aren't happy with that cost, could an amendment be made to reduce that total amount to be raised by taxes? Would that be the simplest way of addressing that if there are concerns? Somebody made an amendment to that? It would be, but we've called the question and the question's now before the board. So it would have to be, if, if we're, we're, we're preparing to vote, if we vote and it's voted in the affirmative, someone who voted in favor of the budget could request reconsideration of the budget, which would, or of that article, which would take us back to the start. Um, but you have to have voted in favor of it. You can't be against the article. Yes? Yes. Uh, actually, years ago, I thought you had 30 days on this. Is that right or no? Not that because I... something was bought that shouldn't have been bought at that time, and they didn't have the money for it. So what? What yeah, happened then? That's a that's a good question. I, I don't. I mean, thirty days. If it weren't, if it wasn't warned properly or something like that, then perhaps it could be reconsidered after. But in general, the law says reconsideration has to happen before the next article is called on the agenda, and by someone voting in the affirmative. So just to get back to where we were, the articles before the board, we have not had uh, enough votes for a paper ballot, so we're gonna we're going to vote. Um, <clears throat> voting on the main motion, the motion asks the body shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures of operating expenses of one million four hundred one thousand one hundred eighteen dollars, of which one million eighty seven thousand two hundred twenty eight dollars shall be raised by taxes and $313,890 by non-tax revenue. Voting aye means you wish to pass the motion. Voting nay means you wish to defeat it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it, and I believe the ayes have it. The motion carries. <clears throat> that brings us to Article 6. Shall the town collect its, pro its real property taxes in two installments with the due dates being October 15th, 2024 and October 17th, 2025? March. March. March 17th, 2025. Thank you, Jesse. You need a motion to bring this before the body? So, so uh, 
The motion has been made and seconded. The floor is now open for discussion on Article 6, which states, shall the town collect its real property taxes in two installments with the due dates being October 15th, 2024 and March 17th, 2025. Uh, maker of the initial motion has the privilege of speaking first. Any discussion? Questions? Call the question. All right. All those in favor of calling the question, say aye. Aye. The question before the board shall the uh, shall the before the body shall the town collect its real property taxes in two installments with due dates being October fifteenth, twenty twenty four, and October seventeenth, March. 20, March seventeenth. <laughs> <laughs> twenty twenty five. Voting aye means you wish to pass the motion. Voting nay means you wish to defeat the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it. We're at a crucial juncture here. We have still three uh, articles before the body, but it's noon. Um, Let's power through. Power through. Power through. Power through. Okay. okay, onward. Um, feel free to hop out and grab a, a refreshment. If you do. Article 7, shall the voters authorize the disabled veterans' property tax exemption to increase from $10,000 to $40,000 of appraised value per eligible parcel in the municipal grant list pursuant to 32 BSA section 3802 subsection 11C. Entertain a motion to bring this before the body. So moved. Who is that? Me. Second. Walt. Motion's made and seconded. The floor is now open for discussion on Article 7. Shall the voters authorize the disabled veterans' property tax exemption to increase from $10,000 to $40,000 of appraised value per eligible parcel in the municipal grant list pursuant to 32 BSA Section 308, Subsection 11C? Luke, you made the motion. Would you like to speak on this? No. Okay. Discussion? I'll just... I'll just think it's okay, sorry. Um, we had a veteran that came in and asked for this. This is by state law. You um, are required to have um, to give veterans and their significant others, or um, I don't know, I think it's just spouses, but um, $10,000. And you can give up to $40,000 in this based on the state law. It was a veteran that came in and asked for that. And I think that's all I had to say. <laughs> and just, just as a little bit of explanation from a lister's perspective, this, this basically takes, currently we're taking $10,000 off the, uh, basically off the appraised value of the property. So it's before taxes are assessed. Reduction. Sorry, I'm, I'm Tim Caulfield. I'm just asking for a clarification. When I was on the select board, this was basically a one one person campaign statewide. There was one guy who went around and tried to get this on the ballots for all of the towns. Is that the case, or is that not the case? In this that is not the case this year. It was an actual veteran who owns the property in the town of Braintree Thank you. that asked for that. Uh, if we were to Paul Kendall. If we were to approve this, what would be the net effect in, uh, in terms of uh, the tax rate for the rest of us? So I did, we had run, I can answer this. If, I don't know if anybody yeah, else um, When we first started, when this first came up, the listers ran some numbers to kind of look at what it would do. Um, if we increase the exemption to the $40,000 maximum, we typically have six to seven disabled veterans in Braintree who take advantage of this. Um, that would, you know, that would add, uh, let's see, 20, if, yeah, it's, 200, it, 280, right, 280,000, which reduces the taxable grant list by 2400 to $2,800. It's a pretty minimal when you're, t when you're talking about per $100 in property value. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't reduce the grant list significantly. It, it's about a $3,000 reduction. Mm -hmm. What question? Was there another comment? I saw a hand back there. I don't have a question. I just have a remark. If it's a disabled veteran, we're speaking English here. You know, I think they've earned it. Thank you. Better to call the question. All those in favor of calling the question, say aye. Aye. Thank you. Opposed? 
So the question before the board, shall the voter, before the body, shall the voters authorize the disabled veterans property tax exemption to increase to from $10,000 to $40,000 of appraised value per eligible parcel on the municipal grant unless pursuant to 32 BSA section 3802 subsection 11C. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. <coughs> Article 8. Beginning in 2025, shall the voters authorize the annual town meeting to be held on the first Tuesday in March, pursuant to 17 BSA section 2640. Look for a motion to bring so this up. Second? Second. Second. Steve, I saw The motion has been made and seconded. The floor is now open for discussion on Article 8. Asking, beginning in 2025, shall the voters authorize the annual town meeting to be held on the first Tuesday in March, pursuant to 17 BSA section 2640. Linda, do you want to speak or do you want to pass it on? Uh, comments, questions, discussion? Does anybody have any idea, comparison to how many people are involved on a Tuesday or a Saturday? So the numbers ended up being about the same as far as how many people show up, whether it's Saturday or Tuesday. You may have changing of some people. Some people can make it Saturday, some people can't, and vice versa on a Tuesday. What I do see myself is that we have more voter participation when we have town meeting on a Tuesday in the various, uh, especially the school budget where we have less than 100 people that vote in a $26 million school budget, and um, and there's just there's more people that vote if we have town meeting on the Tuesday as opposed to because the voting can only happen on Tuesday. Which is a good reminder to vote on Tuesday at the retreat. Uh, it'll be here between 9 and 7, 7 p.m. Okay. Other discussion? Questions? Uh, just to get an idea, would it be possible to have a show of hands how many people in this room currently would be able to attend if it was to be on a Tuesday next year? All right, show, sure, we can just drop a poll. Show of hands if you'd come to town meeting next year on Tuesday. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, raise your hand if you cannot make it next Tuesday, next year on Tuesday. Yeah. And oh, just a follow-up: Are the schools uh, still taking that day off, or would that go back on their calendar? Yeah, yeah. It's a state okay. off. Well, not a state. Not a state. Yes. Other other questions? Discussion. All right. Doesn't look like there's any more discussion, so we can. Uh, the question before the body is Article Eight. Uh, which asks, beginning in 2025, shall the voters authorize the annual town meeting to be held on the first Tuesday in March, pursuant to 17 BSA section 2640? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Appears the ayes have it. We'll see you next year. Sorry. <laughs> Article 9. Uh, this is a long one. I'm going to read it once, and then I'll probably just refer back to it on nature of getting through this. Article 9, shall the voters adopt the following declaration of inclusion? The town of Braintree condemns racism and welcomes all persons, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, age, disability, or socioeconomic status, and wants everyone to feel safe and welcome in our community. As a town... We formally condemn all discrimination in all its forms, commit to fair and equal treatment of everyone in our community, and will strive to ensure all our actions, policies, and operating procedures reflect this commitment. The town of Braintree has been and will continue to be a place where individuals are encouraged to live freely and responsibly, to express their opinions, and listen to the opinions of others. Motion to bring this before the body. So moved. Eugene seconds. Wall, Tim. Okay, the motions before the body shall the voters adopt the following declaration of inclusion, which I read previously and which you all have in front of you. Uh, discussion. Um, was there any particular reason for this to be brought to the board? Did we have any incident in which we were proving to be otherwise? Board? 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> this is um, a statewide effort that is spearheaded by a nonprofit group called, I believe, Vermont Declaration of Inclusion.org. <laughs> um, and it's been underway for three years. Their goal is to get every town and city in Vermont to adopt this, uh, this statement of inclusion. Presently, they have 135 towns of the 246 towns and cities that have adopted it. Um, in our neck of the woods, it's Bethel, Brookfield, Chelsea, Royalton, Corinth, Randolph, Northfield, Roxbury have all adopted this over the past few years. Repre representatives of this group came to the select board before I was on the board and asked that we adopt that. And some towns and cities, boards, have simply adopted it themselves at the meeting. And this board um, chose, chose to bring it to the town for consideration. Um, I will note, does that address your question? Um, yes, just the origin of, of this particular thing, I feel as though Braintree was already uh, already kind of unspokenly abided by that, and I also wonder if there would be any opposition or question to, or, well, I mean, I, I just wonder because they're not residents of our town in which they brought this to the board, um, they're not here today. Um, so I do appreciate was, the statement, but was, I wonder if it was actually a resident. It was a resident. It was a resident. Oh, that's to us out. and talk to us. Perfect. Um, but then You're, I wonder. I, I'm also everybody in town knows and actually think Bob. But I wonder if there was any reason to shorten the statement to the town of Braintree has been and will continue to be a place here. where individuals will encourage that last statement. I wonder if there's possibility of that, um, but there. I, uh, I'll just reserve myself for other folks to speak, and I'll come back if I. Yeah, please use the mics. Yep. Um, my question is, I don't know if this has been asked or if anyone knows the answer, but is there any type of liability to the town by um, stating this? It's it's not a binding. It's not binding in any way. No. Speaking of, all the questions. Hold on, hold on a second. I got a comment online. Okay, comment online. This is the person who brought the motion. So, if I can get in the here. I'm figuring out how to work this thing. Okay, I think you're, you can go ahead, Bob. Yes, uh, I asked the board to consider this. Oh, what happened? Computer went down. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I just want to buy. Can we call him? Uh, Who's got other, other comments, questions while we resolve our technical issue? I have no idea. We just restarted. <laughs> So that was, yeah. That was Bob trying to. That was Bob trying to tell us what's going on. Other comments, questions about we dwell? Uh, I have one. But bear with me for my reserve. I'll just try and get Bob back on here. While we're, while we're waiting here, I did want to thank. Linda Lubel, who every year says she's not coming back to the yeah. <laughs> But somehow she's here every year. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> if anybody wants to help next Tuesday, next year on Tuesday, Linda is always looking for help. So um, want to help prepare lunch. Somebody younger. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I, uh, Lynn Brown had a question. Hey, Grace, can you get Lynn Brown? No, I was going to call the question. Okay, go. Oh, wait, wait, I got Bob. Yeah, okay. Okay. Bob. <laughs> well, maybe. I hate these things. 
things. Won't unmute him. There you go. There you go. All right, Bob, you're back. Sorry, the computer went dead on us. So go ahead. Okay. Yes. Uh, it, it seemed to die from my end. Uh, I pretty much finished what I needed to say. Uh, I just uh, I would like to see us adopt this resolution. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, there's a motion to call the question. All, all those in favor of calling the question, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The question before the board, before the body, shall the voters adopt the following declaration of inclusion? The town of Braintree condemns racism and welcomes all persons, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, age, disability, or socioeconomic status and wants everyone to feel safe and welcome in our community. As a town, we formally condemn all discrimination in all of its forms, commit to fair and equal treatment of everyone in our community, and will strive to ensure all of our actions, policies, and operating procedures reflect this commitment. The town of Braintree has been and will continue to be a place where individuals are encouraged to live freely and responsibly, to express their opinions and listen to the opinions of others. Voting aye means you wish to pass the motion. Voting nay means you wish to defeat it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. It appears the eyes have it. The eyes have it. That takes us to Article 10 to uh, transact any other business not of a binding nature. This is typically a time where people can um, offer interesting things that have happened to them over the course of the year, <laughs> what they're excited about for lunch, things like that. Oh, I, I've got one back there. I just had a Wait for the mic. Oh. <laughs> I had a brief follow up. About Article 9 is just a question of was there any particular incident in which we felt as though we were not meeting this, or was this something that just everyone kind of would like to adopt in making sure it is clarified to the general public? There was there was no there was no incident that prompted us. That's wonderful to know. <laughs> Other business of a non-binding nature. Um, just oh, every oh. three years, Giver Healthcare conducts. Your name, please. Oh, sorry, Kasha Evans. Um, every three years, Giver Healthcare conducts a community health needs assessment and is really looking for input from community members. Um, so there's a survey here, Giver surveys that you can pick up and fill out and return to Gifford. And your voice really does matter in trying to um, move forward in healthcare in our communities. You can just drop that off at the town office. They'll pick it up for me. What Jesse said. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Steve Zed, I was just going to say, while well, I'm not willing to serve on the cemetery commission, I'm willing to help out, and I bet there are others too. If if there's a day designated to go clean up branches from the cemeteries, and the town can yeah. put it in front porch forum or Facebook or somewhere, I think there'd be a good turnout just to to help out and enlighten their shortcomings. That's a great suggestion. Thanks. You see something Other business of a non-binding nature. Yes. Yes, I was going to ask you about reappraisal, but we'll wait and see what the legislature does because who knows? Yep. Yeah, yeah. We, the town will receive a note, a letter, a formal letter this summer, which will give us a little bit more information. So we'll be sure to publicize whatever that, whatever we find out as soon as we know. Why is uh, Rochester Hollow separated out? Why is Rochester Hollow separated out as a line item? Rochester Hollow is part of the road. <coughs> is in Rochester and we speak to the mic. Sorry. Part of the part of that road is in Rochester. It's not part of the town of Braintree, so we get revenue from them for what they pay us to sand and maintain the road. But it's about doubled in the last several years. Right, because we it's were charging. Income. We were charging. That's income. That's money coming to us. We were charging them a low rate for the sand in the past, and we've now raised it to a market rate. Essentially, you afraid we brought that too much? <laughs> no, I don't know about that. But I really don't think it's quite enough yet. <laughs> Lord, Lord is lobbying for us to charge that more. Uh, well, you know, we, we charge by the hour and by the yard, and so 
the, we're trying to determine what's a fair rate to track, you know, for our trucks. And with our trucks going up in price by a hundred thousand, oh, yeah. I still say that the price per hour is a little bit on the low side. So we're working on that by next fall. We're not going to change it this winter. We, you know, really you can't. Yeah. If the money fit down the end of the no. So we're going to wait until October, September, October, and we'll revisit it. Let's see if we have, we have to do it in time to give them a moment to prepare their budget because it's part of, because our charge grows on their budget, so they have to be be able to do that. I didn't. I just asked him why it was a line item. Yes, it, it, but fine. it's because we charge them for the services rendered. At, at their town meeting, they're wondering why they pay for anything. That's right. <laughs> and, and they're and they're also why, asking why it went up so much. So, so, so the ones that don't know, there, there's actually five miles of Rochester Road on this side of the mountain if they don't come around to plow and sand. And they don't, they don't think they have it graded, do they, Dylan? They grade it themselves. They come over and grade it themselves. That's a long way to drive a grader, too. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I, other, other comments? Um, all right. Walt suggesting we're all done with our business, which I think we're all in favor of. So, having no other business to conduct, we will conclude this year's town meeting. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy lunch.